for luck that she wasn't on the podcast. <laughs> no. All right, three, two, one. I'm here with Rookie. Right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pushball Legs podcast. As you can tell, I'm not with Dan again. Jesus Christ, he's still in Switzerland. We, uh, I think he, I think he's lost. The hills are alive. He's been kidnapped. Uh, singing all that business around uh, Switzerland. He's training some people, eating buffets. You've probably seen his Instagram posts and all that. So what we're going to continue doing is de- like delve into uh, our little bag of tricks, basically. So we had Brad Loomis on last week. Um, yeah, he was pretty class. So we thought we'd follow it up with um, somebody who likes to think he's as ripped, um, but <laughs> someone I know very personally. Um, and we have mentioned him on the show before, is Mr. Andrew Casey Johnston. Hello, Andrew. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me on, Tom. Sorry, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, happy to fill in for Dan. Um, yeah, basically. Not as he is at the moment. Uh, Andrew's going to be like the anti Dan, or a little, maybe happier, or maybe ranty, but very much the same. Maybe not as rough as he is. <laughs> maybe not as idealistic, uh, yeah, kind of grumpy and uh, ranty as uh, he can be so um, we'll let you run for a little so how I know I might call Andrew Rookie as we go through this podcast quite a lot just considering that's uh, his nickname um, but yeah now yeah, we can go into that tomorrow so um, yeah Rookie so uh, let's talk about you mate what why why well what's your story in SNC strength conditioning personal training all that kind of stuff accolades you're pretty good at some stuff um I mean, I've been doing sports my whole life. I mean, um, as a kid, you know, I did martial arts um, for about 10 to 15 years, I think. Um, And then at school, all the school sports, went to uni, studied sports science. Um, I also got into cheerleading when I was at uni. And uh, that's my main predominant sport um, that I'm semi-retired from now uh, <laughs> we'll talk about into, that a bit. <laughs> yeah i dive into it a little bit but i don't actually uh i don't have that much involvement in it anymore um and then when i joined uh third space where i work at the moment as a personal trainer i uh started seriously lifting um and that was strength lifting and olympic lifting and i also because my father was a bodybuilder I um, also was used to weights as soon as I got into the gym, so it was kind of a natural thing, and I've been training uh, ever since. Yeah, pretty much. So, well, I think you're doing yourself a little disservice in terms of you do cheerleading a bit. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so and he he is actually fucking good. Um, so, in cheerleading terms, I realised that. A lot of you guys that are listening to us are either bodybuilders, natural physique athletes, powerlifters, strongman, all this kind of stuff. But I, we've also had some shout outs uh, for some sports specific training. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But Andrew, you, you actually, what, you came like third in the world of some sort? Yeah, so um, we had the um, championships, the world championships uh, back in April. Um, and it, yeah, we came third. Uh, yeah. came away with the bronze in Team England so it wasn't too bad <laughs> yeah, that, that's... How we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's not too bad I think third in the world in a, a sport that's probably heavily dominated by uh, American people um... yeah no heavily dominated by Americans and probably by controversial substances but, uh... <laughs> yeah mexican supplements we won't really talk about uh, that's not really our game but um <laughs> yeah so he's fucking good at the cheerleading aspect it's not it's not pom-pom cheerleading no it's a uh, it's competitive <laughs> cheerleading so it's more about uh gymnastics tumbles uh acro sort of gymnastics with stunts and building pyramids stuff like that so it's a lot more uh strength based than uh, what you see on the sidelines. Yeah, pretty much. So if you're thinking that it's like, yeah, the I don't know the stuff you see at NFL games or basketball, it's really not like that. It's basically chucking himself around. And believe me and me, I get to see him uh, train pretty much every other day or whatever at our facility. And uh, yeah, he's a fucking powerful guy. So um, that's what we're going to go into. Obviously, he's been doing a hell of a lot of sports-specific training 
for that kind of stuff and mixing around sports as well. So uh, we did. I for the life of me can't remember the uh, who uh, messaged us about sports specific training, but I did promise we were going to get somebody on who does sports specific training to uh, talk about it. So we're going to get a line of athletes. Andrew's going to be one of them um, that we'll, we'll start to talk about it. But you have the added benefit of actually knowing the theory. So um, yeah, so let's let's dive into that, mate. So we were talking. I think it was this week when we were talking about sports training and yeah. what what do we do for it basically. Um, so in terms of your cheer stuff or gymnasticy stuff, power stuff, um, what would be if you were to start designing programs and start doing your exercise or stuff? What would be your go-to? Is there anything that um, you? For me specific, uh, specifically, it's. Um you know, a whole sort of kettle of fish, you know, we're diving into something that there's a lot of sort of areas that you kind of have to look at. Um, So we're looking at uh, full, you know, stunt building, which requires, you know, pretty much Olympic lifting movements. Yeah. Um, So the Olympic lifts are a massive thing um, for me. And I mean, just kind of reeling it back in, um, I generally stick to the basic sort of movement patterns in the gym because I get all my sports specific training when I'm at training. So the gym is where I actually uh, uh, train, you know, my, my squats, my lunges, my deadlifts, my Olympic lifts. And uh, I look at them as my foundation. Um, in the gym, do I dive out of the box a little bit? Yeah, I do dive out a little bit, but I always kind of keep it in the box. And it's one thing that I see a lot of people make the mistake of thinking they need to do so much complex stuff in the gym, take up loads of space doing these really weird things that you (laughs) you just don't need to do. And when they just need to reel it back and look at the basics and the basics, you can tell if someone is a sort of athlete by the way they sort of train, you know, they've got good squats, they've got good deadlifts, you know, um, uh, what else? Well, I think we were talking earlier in the week and you kind of came up with a point is a lot of people, yeah, in terms of if you've got yourself a box, all your normal fundamental conventional exercises are in that box. uh, Let's fucking nail those before we even start thinking about doing anything outside of it and going really sports specific. I think um, previously I spoke with Dan and we've got um, a pretty decent boxing coach who does uh, some pro boxing guys and has done some, his wife's a uh, world title Holder, I believe he was, yeah. So he did like training with that. Um, And we've talked to him about it before as well. And we're like, 80% of a lot of sports, the training is very, very, very similar in the gym. And believe it or not, you're going to do that extra 20%. Is that's where you've got your actual, yeah, skill coach, basically, of where you go and see those guys. I think it's, I think it's drilled in in obviously American football, normal soccer, football, whatever, rugby, all that kind of stuff. So we'll dive into what happens there. But I think um, so. I went to drawing on that. I went to a conference about uh, three years ago, um, the S and C student conference that I was uh, actually showing my. I was presenting as well. I had a uh, a piece, a just a poster. Um, I was proud of it though. Um, but there was a, there was a guy who was. Uh, the British Olympic Committee about athletics, and uh, he showed us a uh, a four day program in the gym, and was like, "Who, who's, what athlete have I taken this from? Whose program is this?" And it was like all normal stuff, like high step ups, squats. Like he had some leg extensions, some like ab work and stuff in there. And he was like, "That's Usain Bolt's program." And we kind of just looked at each other like, what the fuck? <laughs> and I was like, I can write better program than that. And it was like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't fucking matter. He can nail every single movement. It's all the, it's like he's 80% of everybody is that exactly the same. He, his, yeah. his shit at 20% is so much better than everybody else's. So <laughs> if we start thinking about the sports specific stuff, so um, you're pretty good. So what plyometric. Makes an athlete. What's that? What makes an athlete an athlete? Yeah, what makes an athlete an athlete? I don't know. Um, I was actually thinking about this quite a bit, and uh, I think the only thing that really makes an athlete an athlete um, different, you know, so let's look at, you know, the professionals like Usain Bolt, and uh, um, and then compare him to 
people like us who are, you know, let's say, you know, we're kind of recreational athletes. Fuck you know, fuck. we, we <laughs> get paid for it. So, you know, we have to make a living somehow. And the difference, the main difference between us and them, it's not the programming. You're right. The programming's quite similar. It's the nutrition and recovery they get uh, is one thing that I looked at. And they can recover where we have to go and work. Yeah. They get meals for them. We have to make our own. <laughs> so their nutrition and their recovery is uh, on another level. So they can actually do, um, you know, talking about lifting, the Bulgarian and Russian um, versions of their Olympic lifting, you know, they're maxing out quite a lot. And, you know, they can only do that because of their nutrition and their rest is spot on that they can lift heavy all the time. If we tried to lift heavy all the time, we'd get injured. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the guys know, I mentioned last week that I've been, for the last four weeks, I've been am wrapping. That's as many reps as possible at 80%, 90%, 95%, and 100%. And I'm fucked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm deloading this week. I get to... But on a good side, as you can see, I'm a lot more positive right now because my calories have gone up slightly. I'm on deloading calories and deloading training. So mad i know but it will work trust me um in order to find out about what i'm doing with that then uh, yeah it's really cool so my, my carbs gone up 50 grams my fat's gone up 20 grams thank you dan um for that mate good yeah um <laughs> but if we talk about um actual kind of training implementations that for those 20 percent. so if we were doing so let's call like let's let's say most of our audience will probably in client clientele wise will have rugby players football players tennis players probably mm. these kind of sports right anything that you would any drills any other than let's say they're always going to do a deadlift they're always going to do a squat they're always going to do a lunge they're always going to do a push they're always going to do a pull they're always going to do a carry okay those are six exercises they're always going to do and what else could we start to implement in so with with a lot of these it's all about uh locomotion um so it's uh, things like crawling, skipping, um, you know, movement patterns that you don't generally see. Uh, stuff you put a lot in sort of like dy dynamic warm-ups and stuff like that. You can tell if someone needs uh, some work or if they're an athlete from pretty much how much they're, how mobile they are in their dynamic warm-up. Whether they can skip, whether they can locomote, whether they can do like a karaoke or a run. You know, whether they can bear crawl, like I said, um, and whether they can sort of rotate with that. You know, if they can pick up movement patterns quickly, then you know you're on the right track. Not saying that people who pick up things are the best athletes in the world. No. Um, but um, we want to look at that and be like, oh, okay, maybe sometimes the stuff that they do in training, so... Uh, you know, we look at, for instance, my cheerleading. I do a lot of pushing. I do a lot of overhead work. Yeah. Do I need to do that in the gym? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not I so need much. To do a lot more pulling. Yeah. You know, maybe I need to balance the body out. Um, I mean, we've spoken about that with the boxing stuff as well. And I'm, as we film, well, filming this, recording this, whatever, um, I'm in midway through a weekend with Tony Gentlecore from... Uh, crazy performance which i've already seen him before but i'm i'm seeing another workshop by him with uh, dr lisa lewis some psychology stuff that i really want to see but he talks obviously a lot about baseball and he does fuck all overhead work really he does just like he does trap shrugs like overhead shrugs with his athletes and that's it really <laughs> and landmine presses um yeah, yeah uh, it's uh you know looking at boxing for example you know you would think, oh, you know, boxing, they do a lot of punching, let's do a lot of pressing. But no, yeah, completely. <laughs> we don't want to overload them. They're already doing enough of that in training as it is. Um, so we want to make sure, you know, with my training in, uh, in sports, I try and almost do the opposite of what I do at training to balance my body out, to make sure I'm actually staying healthy. Yeah, because I guess one thing alludes to these people playing sport, what's the best sport person? If you can't compete and you're injured, then you're shit. 
you know, there's no way you can prove that you're the best. So <laughs> actually being physically healthy is going to be a big way to actually even get that in. Um, so yeah, back work for those boxers trying to get their scapula stable and kind of retracted in some sort of depression um, yeah. of their shoulder. Probably a good way to start. Um, so you don't throw that out. Yeah, you then do some reaching technique and stuff like that with maybe a landmine press and you reach out to yeah. draw that back in. That's fine. But let's let's get that stable before um, anything like that. So we were actually discussing before we started, came in, yeah, it was uh, um, the agility drills. So it's something that I guess on the internet is like, is really <laughs> annoying um, because you get... If any, <laughs> anybody's out there, it generally comes from the fucking states, to be honest. Um, with the guys that, um, <laughs> what is it's some of these drills that, um, yeah, just look ridiculous. It's mainly American football. I love American football. Mike Robertson Training Systems is a guy in Indiana who does a lot of really cool work. There's all these kind of outside sources that do really cool stuff. There's a guy in New York that actually we might get on that who does a lot of training for like uh, college sports and high school of American football. But it's these agility drills that concentrate so much on foot speed and kind of jabbing like a typewriter against the floor the all right is is that actually uh gonna benefit them on the on the field of play do you think well yeah i mean this is this is another thing it, when you're on the field you're you you're reacting to other athletes you're not going off your own footwork you're actually having to react to a stimulus and this is you know one of the things that i feel these athletes need to get into is a bit more of reaction drills than these sort of line drills that we see, you know, actually reacting to a stimulus uh, like the gate drills and all that uh, kind of stuff where they can actually react to a stimulus quicker and quicker instead of just moving their feet as fast as they can. Yeah, and like a, a reaction drill, can a stimulus can literally be like an American football hike like a hike of a football. You can yes. literally just shout it. it. Or you can chuck a ball. Blow of a whistle. Then, yeah. Well, I have an issue with that because blow the whistle usually in most sports means stop. Um, so I tend not to use a whistle. I usually use a, yeah, a visual cue of some sort and something like that. So A gun, maybe. A gun, yeah. You can shoot your athletes good. <laughs> maybe in the, the States. That's of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that's that's yeah. I go towards that. So the definition. I think that. What's your definition of agility? Is it going to be? What would you say? What would I say? My definition of agility is. Um, mm. So agility, I would say it's being able to. Well, no, that's more reaction time. Is being able to react to a stimulus. Um, agility is being able to move direction. At speed, yeah. How fast change, you change, can... change direction at speed, I guess. Yeah, um, but, but would be we, that is that reaction to depends, a stimulus as well? We, so that is agility, but in sport specific, we're looking at uh, so with a sprinter, it's reaction time towards that gun. Within American football, it's reacting towards the hips of if I'm a wide receiver. That cornerback um, is looking at my hips and seeing where I'm going to move. And he's reacting to that. And his agility needs to come off that. Yeah. So, I'd, yeah, I'd probably spend yeah spend some time. I, I, I think, like, the T-drills and all that kind of stuff are cool. But maybe, maybe the T-drill with somebody... I mean, you see it in the NFL Combine. And they kind of point the ball to where they want to go. Um, and yeah. that's more the reactive stuff and then yeah that's the cornerback drill where they have to dip and dive like as if they're following a wide receiver and following the eyes of the quarterback or something like that I think that'd be quite cool well I guess it could be like rugby specific as well and football specific yeah it, it can be um I mean I actually was uh hearing some stuff about the combine and a lot of people saying how uh a lot of the combine sort of tests do they actually relate to on-field performance yeah. Um, which was one of the things that um, do you really need uh, some, you know, let's say the typical bench press that they have 
No. no. Um, <laughs> kilos, I think, is for as many reps as you can do. It's 105 kilos. Or 110. Um, something like that, yeah. Yeah, for as many reps as you can do. Is that something that they need to do? Um, I'm, you can quote me right here and right now. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, they don't. Um, but I, for combine, <laughs> they, <laughs> but they, yeah. very interesting in their programming is when they go to the combine, how much they'll have to change their programming. Oh, yeah. So that they can specifically work for those tests. Not work for the sport work for the tests yeah because i think yes that's where you get you get some guys that um yeah just come out and yeah they've they've spent the last six months nailing every single one of those tests talking just doing broad jumps doing vertical jumps trying to increase that and yeah is it an illicit response on the field maybe but Mm. there's probably some better things they could have been doing to be honest to get better game tape oh um so yeah if uh, the so I'd say football, rugby, these are all change of direction sports. Yep. So lateral drills. Um, let's think we've got T-drills. Well, you've got lateral rise. Kind of shuttle, shuttle drills, all that kind of stuff. Change direction yep. steps. Um, that kind of... Um, I like doing like kind of get up off the floor, essentially, for rugby as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Definitely stimulus of getting up because they get taken down a lot. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Getting up the floor as quickly as possible, kind of recovery. You can do that as a defender for football as well. You need a chance you're either going to slide or take somebody out. You've got to recover as well back, um, that kind of stuff. So quick bursts of pace. So sprint repeatability is a big one. If you've got a curve or in your gym or something like that, you're kind of like the 10 second on, 10 second off, something. Sort of thing. Maybe not 10 seconds, like five seconds on. I think people overlook that and go, yeah, I'm going to do 20 seconds on. And it's like, when do you ever sprint for 20 seconds non-stop? in a game not really uh, <laughs> no exactly so plyometric drills you done a fair uh, few of those plyometric drills uh, so I think we're looking at sort of depth jumps or counter movement jumps uh, box jumps um, what other plyometric any sort of uh, so I like a lot of sort of hopping uh, drills multi-directional hopping uh, drills just for that sort of stability in the ankle and the hip, I think it's quite important. Uh, just to make sure there's, like, making sure we've got just as much unilateral as we do bilateral. Yeah, that's cool. Because cool. that change of direction within rugby, football, any of these sort of team sports is very important. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I like go towards some of the, uh, especially for foot speed. Um, kind of acceleration stuff. I do like wall drills. Um, you've probably seen me do them sometimes when I feel like I'm slow on a football field. Um, that's kind of leaning into the wall and I'm kind of getting as much hip flexion and um, then driving down as fast as I can. That puffs me out by doing like eight of them. So uh, yeah, they're fun. Um, apart from that, there's there's there's, there's some uh, there's probably some cool stuff out there. But I think stick to your reactive. Stick to that kind of stuff. If if there is a stimulus you have to react to, start reacting to stuff. Um, you're going to get better, uh, to be honest. Um, apart from that, yeah, do your deadlifts, do kind of pauses, kind of speed work, all that kind of stuff. And oh, there, there's something that we could actually touch on. Um, performance, athletic performance speed work and strength speed work. There are a difference, Andrew? Uh, I don't think so. See, I would say on yes. So just think about some of the stuff we've been doing okay. lately. Speed, uh, so strength, speed, and... And kind of performance athlete speed. So there's been no research about that is... Uh, so powerlifting... What, so yeah. speed deadlifts. So speed deadlifts generally... Have what kind of, So it would be percentage-wise. So we can have... A lot of the guys will hover around... Literature says to hover around 30% to 35% of your 1RM. And you'd only do that for kind of four to six reps for a set. But that's just literally how fast you can move anything. And yeah. then, then, but powerlifting, if we go back onto that kind of stuff, because we talk about that quite a lot, um, is I would just do force of contraction. I'm moving, still moving the far, bar as fast as I can, but I'm f- contracting my muscle a little bit tighter with a bigger stimulus. So I look at the kind of the 50% up to 65%. Yeah, I mean, so... This is where we're all position 
sort of dependent. So if I was on the, let's go back to American football, if I was on the O-line or D-line, I've got a massive guy that I need to move quite quickly, Yeah, which is where that sort of powerlifting speed would come into play. Um, and I think that would be more relevant for them. But then for, let's say, the footballers, they don't, they don't need... They only need to move their body. Yeah. They don't need to move someone else's. That's true. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it, it would depend on the sport you're in and the position you play completely. Yeah. So you probably need to do a little bit more of a so a needs analysis on what position. So positional people are going to be doing different things. Uh, if you're a back or a forward, clearly in rugby, you're going to be doing different things. I think that's quite apparent in most people. <laughs> Most forwards can lift a ton, and most backs are fast as hell. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much where we're going. Um, should we have a little break there, rookie Andrew? Sorry, I'm gonna keep you there. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, on the other side of that, within a within a talk, um, a little bit about basically preparation for a few things, and then the return. Obviously, we haven't really done it. Uh, we didn't do it last week because we didn't have time with Brad. But stupid things on the internet. Push Ball Legs online coaching is open. Contact us at info push ball legs. Three, two, one. We're back with Rookie. All right, good break. Solid, yeah, all right. <laughs> all right, we're going to go into preparation for powerlifting because i'm sure our audience know that i like powerlifting i like training people for powerlifting i like training powerlifting um and i am doing an event in november um i might do two actually there's one following that one but uh, andrew has nicely pointed out in the break that i need to call myself out as it was his idea to do this meet for me and he is joining me in this meet so yeah he's going to be uh, in the same competition but in a lighter weight group because he is ridiculously light and ridiculously lean and I just pile on the pounds when I want to so that's pretty much sums it up right yeah yeah that, that pretty much sums it up <laughs> in uh, under 74 kilo weight class yeah so you'd be competing at the Brad Loomis who we had on last week the same category as him pretty much um, obviously you're in yeah, younger than him, but yeah, he's forty-five, forty-five years old, still a strong oh, is he masters. He yeah, he's kind of mas- He he is masters really. Yeah, so and he got was it US USA Powerlifting Federation last year silver medal, pretty decent. Oh no, yeah, I'll put out the video uh, of him passing out during his max deadlift uh, on his last. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Oh, no. uh, it was just, it was, yeah, it was really good. But, um, yeah. So, so at the moment we're both prepping for our powerlifting, which is in November, November 8th. <laughs> was it 19th or 19th? One or two. Yeah. Uh, around about there. <laughs> November, uh, 18th, 19th weekend. Yeah. Okay. So, we should be starting to really think about it now. Um, obviously, I have my own coach, so he's starting to think about my prep now. Um, but Andrew is taking a different approach to me, obviously. Um, so I'd like him to go go off on one right now. So talk about what you're you're doing, mate. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing uh, my own periodization, which I know for a lot of people, is the wrong way to go about it. Um, you know, you kind of do want a coach. Um, but I like to challenge myself. I want to challenge myself to be able to do it. So I'm taking it upon myself to write my own programming. And I know my body better than a lot of people. I just have to be... <laughs> um, I just have to be honest with myself in terms of that, what exercises I am not good at. You know, because we all fall into the same trap of doing the same exercises we enjoy doing. You know, I enjoy deadlifting. I don't enjoy as much squatting. You know, so I need to make sure that I'm squatting a lot more. You know, I need to make sure that I have a balanced workout for me. Um, 
At uh, current, uh, I'm not on any specific program except uh, a, actually a rehab program um, that I'm going through at the moment because about two, maybe three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I uh, injured my shoulder uh, doing some snatches, um, which I know some of you would think that's a bit weird that a power lift is doing. <laughs> Very weird because uh, yeah, I've I've spoken out about this that I haven't done any snatches for a, about a year and a half, and my yeah. shoulder's lovely. So yeah, um, um, yeah. I mean, so uh, the premise of why I'm doing this powerlifting competition is actually a build up into Olympic lifting, um, and maybe even CrossFit, but I'm unsure of that. Um, so I wanted to bring it back, and powerlifting, I feel, is um, my first step. You know, I want to get my body stronger, so I want to challenge myself. So I want to put myself in a sort of competition area. So a powerlifting competition is the way I want to go about it. But I also do want to make sure that there is an inclusion of Olympic lifting through the, my process, so I keep the technique up. Um, did I go a bit heavy that day? Yes, I did. That was my <laughs> fault. <laughs> um, but it hasn't affected my powerlifting too much. I just have to reduce the amount of pushing I'm doing upper body. Uh, so I can still do my deadlifts, I can still do my squats, but I've had to completely change the periodization of how I'm pushing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. it's a lot more pulling, essentially. Fair enough. Um, yeah, it's a bit tough. A bit tough. Obviously, do you, do you kind of know what's happening with your bench at the moment? Because obviously, that's that's that is one of the three lifts that you'll be doing. Um. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did bench uh, recently. Obviously, lighter, just yeah. the slight weight to keep it going. But um, it did feel a bit weaker, uh, and I think it will. I don't think it'll have a massive impact because it is. Um, there was no pain in the shoulder. It didn't aggravate the shoulder. It just didn't feel 100%. So um, I think it would take a little bit of a toll, but not too much that it should affect my total that much because I'm really trying to push my squats and my deadlifts. So I don't think it should affect it too too much. And we've still got quite a long time. Yeah, to be honest, we've still got what, nearly three months, really. Um, I guess but this is probably where yeah I'm starting to I know I've sat down with John and uh, said I was smashed through that's why I'm deloading everything diet wise and everywhere I'm almost at weight so I can kind of play around a little bit more I've only got yeah what is it two kilos that I need to lose and I'm at weight so that I'm right now yeah well Andrew has the uh, lucky ability of uh having the craziest neat in the world and uh, <laughs> and just seems to burn everything else so I, I swear I do as much, many steps but yeah I just I I kind of absorb food um, yeah very easily um, but yeah we, we know that we know the process of it obviously that my neat is probably not as high as yours so therefore I would easily put it on because um, you cycle to work all that jazz so get my new bike this weekend so it'd be funny um, cool so what what Training method, you're doing some West Side stuff, what you're going into. So, uh, so once I've finished with uh, my shoulder, uh, once it's got better, which I'm hoping huh. in the next week or two, it should be 100%, um, I'm going to go into the conjugate method of training. So uh, if people aren't familiar with the conjugate method, uh, it's a, a four-day-a-week training program uh, where it'll be uh, a max effort lower body on um, the first day so that's a max effort either a squat or a deadlift um, of one style of movement whether that's uh, a deficit deadlift a rack pull or if it's like a box squat um, and you change up that exercise every week uh, through the uh, through the uh, eight week cycle okay. um, and then the second day, it will be a max effort upper body. So if we're looking, obviously we're looking at the bench press. So different variations of bench press, board press, floor press, yeah. again, close grip press for, again, eight weeks. So you'll do a max effort lower, max effort upper. 
and then it will be a speed lower and then a speed upper. So um, as we talked about before with the speed work, obviously with powerlifting, it's a, a little bit heavier, that percentage for that speed work. Uh, so we're looking at uh, 50, 60 yeah. percent for yeah. speed work ish depending on <laughs> who what research or what you look at. yeah it just it depends but it goes from person to person i swear it does because yeah. i felt like moving the bar fast yeah. then then that's fine as long as that as long as you're not slowing down but in that rep set so you know let's say we're doing five reps or something like that as long as we're not slowing down in those five reps then that's a fine percentage. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I just, I work off, if you feel like you're going faster than what you normally would at like your 80%, then you're, you're sound, really. You're moving yeah. faster than normal. Or if you, but if you really think, oh, I'm slowing down, then I, there's no reason why you can't like chuck a pause in there or really slow your eccentric phases down. That kind of stuff is, it's still a variation. Fuck it. You've, there's, there's three different variations I've just given you guys. You can slow eccentric phases, pauses, and speed work. There's three variations of a squat, deadlift, or what. I mean, I'm not I'm not a massive fan of pause deadlifts. I think it's a weird thing to do. Um, sometimes I don't really use it, but sometimes it might it might have a... I did do it before, um, but I, I felt like it... Maybe when you're building up lower, kind of lumbar back, like contraction stuff, it maybe need it, but I'm at the... I think I'm at the point, well, I'm sure we're both at the point and we're trained, we're probably really intermediate lifters because um, we, yeah, we're both still really in our 20s, so we can't really call ourselves advanced. Um, but we know what's going on and we've kind of earned the right that our lumbar is strong and it'll pretty much never hurt after a heavy deadlifting session nowadays. Um, I think it's what people are trying to shy away from, maybe jolt. Yeah, well, yeah. No, and I mean, especially if you're trying to, you know do deficit deadlifts or you know scrap snatch grip deads or something like that you know your lumbar spine's got to be pretty strong and also pretty flexible yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty much mine is well, not so uh <laughs> lumbar spine should be flexible it should be your thoracic spine that's flexible <laughs> yeah so there's there's not much i mean we went through that actually this morning where we were talking about thoracic extension and stuff like that there's not an overly that much range uh happening in your thoracic but it yeah it's definitely something that should be able to withstand some some torture basically on the other side where your abs are compressing that's the whole point of your belts etc and the powerlifting stuff is yeah actually not just pressing forwards it's meant to be squeezing from every angle of that belt pushing against it from back side everywhere so it's maybe something that people might start to uh, look at and not just kind of pressing in with their abs and blowing out or whatever uh, start thinking we talked about maybe in future episodes we'll talk about canister breathing and stuff like that but um cool so shoulder issues feeling okay um yeah so the shoulder's fine especially uh so when i squat uh i i saw one of our osteopaths at the gym doug Tannehill. Right, doug's doug's been mentioned on the podcast before yeah. oh yeah <laughs> um so he had a. Look, I got him to have a look at it because self diagnosis is definitely the wrong way to go about anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I got him to have a look at it. He suggested try and keep away from getting that arm overhead uh, or behind in like the back squat position. Try not to get it back uh, on the bar. So my variations of squats have been more safety bar squats and uh, front squats. Yeah, which which plays into your kind of wheelhouse with your massive quads. So um, yeah, that's int <laughs> interesting. So yeah, I've seen him training uh, recently, so it does look good. A um, little bit different method that I'm doing. Obviously, I've just come off like an AMRAP four week period, which has totally fucked me over. I came off a twelve week uh, gradual kind of intensification volume, then intensification of load then real intensification of load twice so i uh, kind of did hypertrophy into power into strength and then i did basically kill myself for four weeks now i'm deloading um i'm not too sure how long for i'm in vote for like 10 12 days of a deload um but i think uh, <laughs> that'll be decided by mr john clark um yeah i know my nutrition is only uh seven days i think dan's given me 
um, till next Saturday. So I'm gonna enjoy it whilst I can. Um, yeah. So also, what else? Um, I know you're very much prepping for it. Is uh, something I gave a shout out to the other day was uh, the pocket prep for CSES. So um, in terms yeah. of, uh, I we get a fair few questions uh, to the podcast, and I guess it can pose to you. Uh, as well because I know of your stuff that you go off and do but personal trainer education um, so we're yeah we're going to do uh, CSCSs with certified strength and conditioning coaches um, that stuff is that what it sounds for? yeah uh, no <laughs> uh, certified strength uh, and conditioning certified specialist strength and conditioning specialist yeah there we go yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah it's more it's actually more team isn't it the team thing I believe that's what it's geared yeah. towards because there is a PT one as well. It's towards strength and conditioning towards sports athletes um, and generally they are uh, team sports athletes but you obviously will get a few that are individual, you know, talking about let's say our golfers, they're obviously individual um, and other sport, you know, tennis, that's individual, that's all but generally, when we're talking about strength and conditioning, you're talking about team sports. Yeah, very much. So, um, yeah, because the CSCS stuff, how's the pocket prep, um, all the preparation for that going as well? All good? Uh, yeah, it's going well. So uh, with the app itself, you get, uh, when you buy it, you get 600 questions. Yeah. And yeah. I think I've answered all 600 of them. <laughs> I can't say I've got them all right. Yeah. I've got about, so out of the 600, I think when I last checked on my iPad, it was about 559 or something that I okay. got right. Um, I like it. It's really good. I, it gets me as an English person used to how Americans word questions because yeah. it is American qualification. Um, also, it does dive into uh, a lot of different areas that, as a personal trainer, you never have to dive into, which is the organization and administration side of things about a strength and conditioning facility uh, and how and the safety regulations or the health regulations and who and the construction actually of of a building. Yeah, which is very abnormal to me <laughs> it's fucking weird for me as well when i've been doing it as well we've been kind of cycling through and then uh <laughs> the ones that you trip up on are those really odd ones like yeah. i don't know the gym flow of yeah how where you're meant to put stuff nearer the door and how much space you meant to have for uh, like changing facilities or or even stuff like uh disciplining athletes is a really odd one as well yeah, yeah. No. I came across that same question. Yeah. It was about the discipline. So like, obviously with PTs, how would we discipline clients that pay for our services would be uh, <laughs> really odd. We can't yeah. send them send them home. Uh, like, oh, I will not going to get paid then. Um, <laughs> so it's, not, it's a bit different. Um, obviously, but uh, in terms of, is there anything that, uh, it was just a bit of guidance for a few guys that have reached out to me. Any guidance on educational courses or anything that you would do or certifications that you would do or something that you have maybe you would recommend well, apart from this apart from C uh, CSCS is, is we're going to take this as a given um, it's pretty much America Europe here well, yeah Australia yeah. I guess probably recognise it as well yeah no Australia will recognise it it's, it's, it's a worldwide recognised yeah uh, you can you can put it after your name that's cool um it's a little bit different to the UKSEA, uh, Strength and Conditioning Association stuff. So that is actually a hell of a lot more intense. We, I, when I was doing my S and C side of my bachelor's degree, we followed some of the syllabus for that for a little bit. Um, yeah. So, but then you actually have to write a bit of a thesis and a, a, a log on athletes and that kind of stuff and present none of that on the CSES over here because you don't actually have to do any practical work it's it's literally it's a written exam I guess or, yeah it's written yeah. practical essentially yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so the exam is I think four and a half hours long split into theory and practical yeah. and it's a multiple choice question questionnaire on both of them 
<laughs> Fair. Cool. So yeah, any what's what educational courses then? Would you shout out to anything? Um. Okay. Let's have a look. Um. For for new personal trainers, for what are we looking at? So for for a basic understanding of assessment, the FMS, I quite yeah. enjoy. You know, it's a, a uh, it's a fundamental uh, course that I think is sort of great to sort of bring new people into and what you can go into if you're a bit more advanced if you're like an osteo or a physio um then the sfma yeah the sfma is meant to be a little bit more clinical orientated it's right clinical yeah no i've done i've done that one um uh, that was a lot more clinical i was with a lot of physios and osteos uh that weekend um but i do think if you um, have the knowledge, then the SFMA can be brilliant. Um, but you have to have a lot of sort of time behind your back. You have to have a lot of sort of training experience and knowledge to go on to something like that. Um, other courses, I'm not actually that. I don't know that no, many. I mean, I mean, like the courses and stuff, because obviously a lot of uh, a lot of stuff kind of get reps accreditation nowadays and. Yeah. Kind of stuff like that but it's it's weird the ones that actually give you certificates or certifications of some sort the fms does i guess that's fms yeah, so qualified or the whatever FMA, you both you have to take the uh weekend course yeah um and then you have to do uh, an online exam for yeah. the certification of both of them um, so yeah, I would I would hazard towards those. Um, obviously, CSES I would go towards nutrition wise, you know, ISSN diplomas stuff like that. Um, if you can, um, anything below that like Martin Mac Uni or that's just come out. Um, someone like uh, Gary Mendoza's Academy um, stuff that's reps accredited or diplomary um, would be cool. Precision Nutrition's always gets kind of beaten around um that's one i massively heard about but i yeah. don't i can't i people wouldn't be able to quote me on whether i know if it's good or not all i know is you have a massive book <laughs> yeah we've seen the book it's fucking huge um so <laughs> yeah that's about it but on the education side i think it was uh, one of the chaps asked us this um go for it with what would be your advice on if it was online training so um yeah. Oh, not online training. So if you were doing your reps level three, would you rather do it in a classroom or online? Oh, obviously in a classroom. In a classroom. Um, I think that would be exactly the same. Yeah. Any, sort of, any sort of educational thing. Um, I mean, for CSCS, okay, you know, this is, uh, it is all home study. You know, it's an online course. So you kind of do have to already have the background knowledge to be going into this. But, um, in England itself, we have the UKCA courses, yeah. the Olympic lifting, the speed, the plyo course, and another one, training, training periodization. The one I went to, yeah, with the two of the guys that were teaching it, called Nick Grantham and Dr. Roger Lloyd, who are awesome. I like following their work, but um, when I went, it was a little bit like sucking eggs because uh, it was on programming design and something I kind of proud pride myself on that i'm reasonably good at and i can periodize plans quite well uh especially for like yeah powerlifters working back from meeks etc i should know where to taper all that bollocks um yeah and i end up having most of an, an argument with another trainer about <laughs> uh about train um what testing uh they they gave us like five tests that we could do within a basketball team and i i disagreed with one of his um basically uh that was all I, I spent a lot of time doing that so yeah it was a bit it was it was a really good foundation but yeah. maybe there's I think, I think it's very important people understand you know you want to be good at training periodization it is a very important thing of being able to program someone's training um uh it probably isn't the most popular thing which is quite no. annoying um <laughs> but it is just as essential as the pro it's even more essential than the program itself is yeah. how it's periodized yeah so yeah i mean i mean there's a lot there's been a bit on the internet about that actually this week i thought um was about just all that well actual essential stuff was basically just follow a program basically if you do it three times a week the chances are you'll get better um yeah 
and look better and reach your goals better um, not just faff around doing weird exercises and yeah changing it every single time and yeah all this kind of bollocks um, so let's let's cap that conversation there um, I have one but you you know of our regular feature on yeah, the podcast I do. <laughs> I do know of it so we're actually going to do two and this is just in light of we had Brad Loomis who is such kind of a ray of sunshine last week and I thought it was quite cool maybe uh, instead well we're going to do stupid things on the internet this week and cool things on the internet this week so we're going to give a shout out to people that are doing good work uh, essentially because I feel there's been enough negativity thrown uh, around as well we might as well balance it out we get, we're doing a stupid thing and a cool thing all right so you can do the positive thing so you can do cool things on the internet but um shout out to seb james who uh loves to troll basically um uh yeah <laughs> he's getting a bit of a reputation actually about that but there's um with this kind of says it all really the, the front page of this website is organic health guru um uh, very interesting. So the the biggest stupid thing on the internet this week, um, or stupid kind of phrase that I'm really not cool with, is is the word inflammation, um, and how your body creates. It's it's obviously been beaten around. Who's uh, Tracy Anderson uses it quite a lot. Um, gurus tends to start to use the inf- word inflammation, and your body stores information, and that's how the basically. Um, your body stores fat and stores it as inflammation um, therefore you get fat because of that it's generally what I hear about she did post stuff recently actually I read about <laughs> her workouts actually gurus are, I guess I do say that gurus are a negative uh, yeah this is really annoying so um, yeah, this it, this, this was just a YouTube video that uh, Seb sent to us and the title of it is learn how inflammation is affecting you more than you think uh when and this chap explains a wasp sting and correlates that to uh basically eating bad food and that's the same as a wasp sting i'm gonna say no it's not um i understand that inflammation can you can think about that in terms of artery health and maybe that some of the stuff that goes through your arteries or veins that causes inflammation therefore it gets clogged and it can lead to whatever that was, um, like angina or the cloggy artery stuff. But um, no, getting fat is not inflammation. It's fat cells and it's too much food. We, we know calories in, calories out. We don't need to beat around the bush with that. So, they, so yeah, inflammation, fuck off. That's a really weird word to start using for people that put on weight. It's not, I, oh, I'm just storing it as inflammation. Or, I look, my, uh, my bum has got inflamed. Uh, it's not, that's not a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so um yeah so that's stupid information fuck off um so cool thing on the internet this week let's let's give some credit out you're good at that yeah i am actually <laughs> i mean giving credit where credit's due um i think a good thing on the internet um that i've seen and i've actually been listening to uh yeah. is the performance podcast. Boo! No, it's just, Boo! Sorry. Another <laughs> podcast. Ah! What are we going to do? Um, no, I think, you know, giving credit where credit's due, I do listen to your podcast. I listen to, I look up a, lo- a lot of sort of podcasts so I can, you know, I've got to listen to something on my cycle into work. Exactly. And you don't do it every day, so um, <laughs> I've got to listen elsewhere. Um, and the performance podcast was actually one that I came across. Uh, a guy named Will Fleming and Coach Dose. Uh, two guys, uh, absolutely phenomenal, from America. Uh, Will Fleming is an uh, Olympic uh, lifter, uh, lifting coach. And Coach Dose is a strength and conditioning coach uh, based in America. And I think the stuff that they're doing on their podcast towards performance athletes uh which is what they their specific audience is towards is really good and uh, they say some they give great advice great free advice which is what i enjoy i like to see people who actually go out of their way to give something for free to people and you can listen to their podcasts for free, don't have to pay for anything and get so much out of it. And I've got so much out of it. 
I actually need to still review their podcast. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I've, I've reviewed yours. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> review theirs. Yeah. That's good. So good. Shout out to uh, Performance Podcast. So, yeah, they're doing good work. Um, yeah, go over and listen. That's one of the reasons why we, we started podcast because I've listened to so Barbell Shrugged and Brett Contreras podcast and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah, that really got us into... Um, basically podcasting and giving info out that we want to kind of share essentially and chat bollocks every now and again so um, yeah awesome man thanks um, so big big thanks for you for coming on filling Daniel's void um, so hopefully everybody enjoyed uh, your chat on cheerleading sports specific uh, powerlifting all that kind of crap um, we will definitely have to get you back on when we're post competition and we'll have a little uh, little jam about what what it was like competing because obviously we got a half hour audiences bodybuildery and they in terms of powerlifting events this is going to be our our first meet as well that's the point is why we're doing this is yeah. we're we're going to get better for our clients uh, essentially so we're going to know exactly what the prep feels like exactly what the kind of exactly interaction on the day is like that kind of stuff obviously we we've competed at our sports respectively so we know how to compete but it's just totally it's going to be a really weird one because it's maximum yeah. effort and all that maximum kind of stuff. Effort. You know, you've got warm ups, you've got very strict rules and regulations that we're going to have to go over, and I keep on forgetting a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, like um, random, all the belts and all the yeah, all the different are. pieces of equipment you can and cannot wear, all the way down to you know what socks and underwear are you allowed to wear on the day. <laughs> Well, uh, put it out there. I will be wearing uh, my girlfriend's and see how that feels. Um, good. Fair enough. Then I can <laughs> help with your weigh-in. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll be. I'll have to sit a, a couple, uh, maybe a kilo below, like the week before, so I can eat. Um, I believe. So uh, that's going to be very interesting. Find out whether I weight make weight as well. But I think Dan's going to be posting a picture of me when I was fat and me at weight. Um, yeah, so you can see the difference between what powerlifters sometimes do as well. Whereas uh, yourself, yeah. you just stay weight. So I think the ha the heaviest you were about like 70, 79 kilos, wasn't it? About that? Seventy-eight, actually. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so. that's when I was trying to gain weight. I mean, that was yeah, just before I did my experimental diet. But um, all right, we did. We digress. We'll get that in the next time. <laughs> yeah, talk about that. That was a long topic. But yeah, I was 78 kilos. Now I'm comfortably at about 74, which I just need to be under 74. So cut my uh, cut the calories for the day and I'm done. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we've got... We'll, we'll close up. So plug, Rookie. Plug your stuff. So obviously you're online. You've got an online presence. Um, yeah, ch chat about anything you want. You've got two minutes. Go. <laughs> um, well I won't really plug myself that much I mean people can search for me online I've got a website andrewcaseyjohnston.com uh, I've obviously got Facebook and Instagram all Andrew Casey Johnston I believe I don't know them off the top of my head but <laughs> for Andrew Casey Johnston I should come up um, visit my website visit my Facebook my Instagram I do a little bit on Twitter not a lot and yeah, but I haven't actually posted in a while because uh, of all this educational stuff I'm doing. I just don't have the time to do it. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very, it's very it, telling. Uh, I've been told that you can tell when you're busy, and because I don't post every day or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, that, that does happen, guys. Um, I try to be a little bit more regimented with it at the moment. Obviously, we're putting out pieces every every other day at least. Um, yeah, and also on the push pull private group, there was a picture of Andrew doing a uh, ninety ninety stretch for one of my clients actually because I couldn't be bothered to do it, so I just got him to do it. So <laughs> yeah, so uh, that didn't didn't reach the general public. Um, cool, man. Uh, thanks for coming on, and I will I will see you in a bit, man. Yeah, see you on Monday. <laughs>